I got to a moment of panic where for me, he was never worried, but I was, and I told him, I'm really scared. I, I thought, you have that moment of flight or fight? And of course, we knew the answer was, we're gonna stay. It was a regular night. We were home together getting ready to make dinner and we have this wives group text that we exchange information between one another. And we had saw on the news that there was this fire over by St. Thomas Aquinas. A massive wildfire raging in Southern California is getting bigger. Authorities say high winds are feeding the Thomas fire, helping it grow. We kept getting the text. Okay, now it went from Fagan and then to Adams and then... The entire hill fire all through Edmonton is on fire. All the street lights are out, there's ashes everywhere. When you actually got the call from Bud that it was in Aliso, that's yeah. when I think we got a little bit more concerned. But even then you thought we had time. Well, all the larger landowners, were, we all run cattle operations. So we all are in the same Cattlemen's Association, we're all friends, and we all communicate together. So as the fire marched from ranch to ranch, we were getting calls from the other ranchers that said, hey, it just came over into Fagan Canyon and it's moving really fast. Then we got a call from one of the ranchers in Weeder Canyon. They said it came over into Weeder Canyon and it's moving fast. Well, that was only like an hour's worth of time. I thought this thing's gonna be here in a couple hours. And by this time, it's, I guess it's around close to midnight, somewhere close to midnight, the morning of the 5th, but right around there. And uh, at any rate, we got a call from Bud Sloan, a rancher up in Aliso Canyon, and a friend of ours, and he said, hey, this thing just came over into Aliso Canyon, and it's moving really fast. And at that time, we were busy. We had three of our employees. One of my sons was out of town, but my other son was there, and of course, my wife, Bonnie. We were busy moving vehicles away from the edge, you know, of our, of our lot where our work yard is and getting things summed up around our house and making sure we didn't have any little piles of leaves up against the house. We were wetting down the roofs, so if there was anything in the gutters that we had missed since the last time we cleaned the gutters, then it would make that material wet. We were doing everything we could waiting for this fire, and I told my guys, we got about two hours to finish this routine up. And one of our employees went up to our water tanks and was actually putting, turning the secondary tank on so we had more supply. And about that time, he called me on the phone. He said, hey, Rich, look below the tanks. And there were three spot fires on the western slope of Sexton Canyon. I just got the call that the fire was in Aliso Canyon. Well, that's, as a bird flies, five or six miles away. But it, the fire had jumped that far. Well, that fire was still moving away from us because it was on the downwind side of the, the house and the work yard. I said, guys, we've got like less than 40 minutes. And I looked behind me and I could see back on the prevailing ridge line back behind us from the direction the fire was coming to the northeast. And I saw a glow. And the next thing I know, just seems like well, it was just a couple more minutes, I saw that glow turn into flames coming over the top. And I said, that thing's gonna be here in less than 15 minutes. And we continued to diligently do our work. And as I looked up that canyon, I heard a roar and it came down that canyon spinning like a cyclone from edge of the canyon to edge of the canyon and oak trees were popping and throwing big things and I could just hear brush popping and oak trees popping and things were really going and it got to us in like a minute. That's a sound I'm never gonna forget. A and minute. this I, I remember saying to Rich, look, it was right in our backyard for us. I mean, our house is there. We just finished building our house. Our little mobile home still up and we're getting prepared. And, but it, once it was there, uh, you were just caught in this moment of time uh, and you forgot about, I think, everything else except for putting out the fire. Right. I mean, um, it, you go into this survival mode where, uh, thankfully, our leader was rich because uh, we all looked at him like, what are we supposed to be doing? I mean, he's used to managing controlled burns and working with the fire services. I'm not. And uh, he just very stoically said, Here's what you need to do. Let's start tendering the hoses. You go here, you go do this. And it was kind of command and control. I told her, besides that, I got the hose. You stay next to me. If you catch on fire, I'll put you out. Yep. <laughs> and she said the same thing. I made a promise. If I catch on fire, you grab the hose and put me out. It hit so fast, we just started breaking the horses out of the corral. And we have a large lot. Our, our lot's like an acre that we have cleared where our home and our little work yard is for the ranch. And we took the horses and tied them to a tie rock out in the middle of that one acre lot. We knew they'd be good. We also knew that that was our, our defensible space. 
the place that if we lost everything, that we could walk out in the middle of that lot and that we were far enough from the active flames that at the end of the day, we would have been safe. So that's why we decided to stay and defend our home. We just finished building this brand new house. We moved into it six weeks before the fire. And all these years, I've been living in a mobile home up on the ranch, and we built this beautiful Rancho California style home and I could just see it going up in flames. So we stayed and we fought that thing as hard as we could, but it was trying because as the fire came off to one side of the lot, 600 bales of hay caught on fire all at one time. Just flashed and boom, and they're burning like all get out. And over on the other side of the lot, I had some equipment we hadn't moved. I had to tell the guys, stop moving the equipment because the fire was blowing through the equipment section of the work yard. Yeah. So I told them, I can't get anybody hurt. You guys get out here and come over here and help us defend the house. We'll have to let happen that happens over there. A backhoe caught on fire, a hydro cedar for restoration work caught on fire, um, several pickup trucks we lost. We lost a lot of equipment. We lost one of the barns up there at that site that was full of equipment and quad runners and our RTV. And so you had a barn on one side about 50 feet from the house burning, and 100 feet from the house on the other side you got 600 bales of hay, and then there's assorted spot fires all throughout the yard. And even up against the house with new leaves that have blown up against it, but we were there with the hoses and managed to just keep putting these little spot fires out before they could catch the house on fire. Well, I remember when Alejandro was helping and Richie and they're moving the horses, um, they were moving as quickly as we, and we have 12 horses, so it takes some time to get them out. And when those hay bales went on fire, I thought we were going to lose Alejandro. We didn't see him for a couple of minutes. Uh, and so at some point, there, I'll never forget, some of the horses went to the front side of our house and our courtyard in our new house and um, they sat there for a while till we could move them over. Uh, our son Richie, his jacket caught on fire. I, I kept his jacket because it's just that reminder of um, the calmness that he demonstrated. I mean, he's, he's a young man, he's 20. And he and I spent a lot of time side by side together uh, just working on spot fires and Rich would go back and forth and we were con once you had one area then something else and then it would go back again to the same spot but I think we kind of came together in a way that allowed us to know everybody had a job keep calm just do what you need to do and we're gonna get through this and it was dawn right around when the fire trucks finally could come up? Actually, the fire protection agencies couldn't make it to us mm -mm. because A, they were so busy with all the fires in the urban neighborhoods, which is really understandable. Yeah, we don't And we're out by ourselves, you know, two and a half miles back behind Foothill Road. And also, um, a pole had fallen in the road when the fire flashed down the canyon. So they just really couldn't get up there. We were, we were on our own. Priority traffic for operations, go. Officer um, Battalion 62, I can't get out on TAC right now. I need traffic control to close Sexton Canyon. No more vehicles going into Sexton Canyon. Uh, the, the canyon is cut off with fire. We've got about 10 to 12 people cut off by fire right now, and I've got civilians trying to make it up there to help them out, and I need that road closed immediately. Copy, Brent. Uh, did you copy that? Uh, immediate hard closure of Sexton Canyon with fire impacting currently. Copy that. Break. I see that you copy that. You can get a law enforcement rep for immediate closure of Sexton Canyon. Uh, vehicles and people trapped by fire. My job was to keep everybody safe. I had to keep everybody with an eyesight and said, don't get in some place where this fire can get you. Stay where you can always get to the middle of the lot. Don't ever get where you can, in an area where the fire can encircle you. You have to be on the open, defensible space side of the lot. So we keep, kept everybody out there in that direction. And, and not to go in the house or go into the structures. I mean, that's the other thing you don't think about. He had the wherewithal to say, close off the venting, close all your windows, because that's how those embers, right, can come through your windows and cause a fire. Um, I think none of us expected how hot and how long it was going to burn. That's the part that I remember. I remember my hands, um, they're healed now, but the embers just burning your hands, your neck, and the top of your head. And there was a point I kept calling 911. Rich kept saying, call them, that we need backup service. And they would keep saying, now is it imminent? I'm like, no, you don't understand. My husband has a hose on the house so it doesn't burn. And you know, we know they're doing the best that they can. It was extraordinary what they did. And I got to a moment of panic where for me, he was never worried, but I was. And I told him, I'm really scared. I, I thought, you have that moment of flight or fight. And of course, we knew the answer was, we're gonna stay. Right, because when you're up in a spot like that and you do have a defensible space, 
to try and leave that is often where the mistake gets made. So if you try to drive down, you, you say, I got to get out of here, and you drive down Sexton Canyon Road, you want from having hundreds of feet of clearance to having 12 feet of clearance on each side of the road, and that's not enough. And also you get in a blackout to where there's so much smoke, even with your headlight, how headlights make it worse, that you can't see a foot in front of your windshield. So inevitably you can't find the road, you'll drive off the edge of the road and get stuck, and the wildfire will get you that way. So we knew where our defensible space was, we utilized it, we fought hard, we saved a lot of things, but we lost a lot of things. We lost some cattle in the fire. You know, although I had them in a pasture that was managed, we had 150 cows in that pasture. About 14 of those cows got in a bad situation in the brush and tried to hunker down there, and next thing they knew, the fire was all the way around them. And you can tell they were all were trying to run through the fire because they were all heading the same direction. Yeah. And one leader tried to bust through the fire, but they just didn't make it. And then there were some cattle that did make it through the fire, but just weren't going to be well enough to survive. So we had to go out the next day and put some of those out of their misery. But, you know, actually a lot of the cattle did the right thing and stayed in those, their own defensible space. They're pretty smart and they know that they need to be in an open area. So I say out of 150 head of cattle that were in a pasture that completely burned up, the, the fact that, you know, only about 18 head total burn was really a blessing. Um, and we saved our office and um, Chief Ken Corney, in fact, that night of the fire when it was just really at its height, like I said, I couldn't get into 911 as a response. I called him on his cell phone and he picked up, talk about a voice of comfort. And I told him what was going on and he said, I've got the fire captain right here, Bonnie. And so by dawn, when we had gotten most of it out, they helped us with the office. They came back with what little water they did have yep. to come up to see how they could be um, helpful to us. And we noticed right then and there, there were crews that weren't from home yeah. that were out here already, which says so much and how fast they mobilized that they got these crews. I think one of them was from like Alameda or something. Yeah, we had a crew from Alameda and a crew, city crew from Oxnard that finally made it out there in the, in the dawn. And, uh, you know, they were very helpful and continued to put out spot fires because for hours and hours, spot fires were still a risk. In the orchard, you can and imagine. And are still smoldering all over and all it takes is a wind to blow them up and up against the building and off. That's why buildings were burning after the main fire went by days later in some of the other areas. And so it was really important that we c continued to put out all those spot fires. They were very helpful in helping us do that, actually. That building, that ranch building was really saved by the land management that we had done with the cattle grazing yeah. because we weren't down there when the fire went through. It, and I, I swore I looked down yeah, and saw that, the off, saw that the office was on fire. I could have swore I saw it all burned up. But it was just all the trees and bushes around the office and some certain section back behind and then down the canyon. More. Everything was confusing because of how everything was on fire at once in the whole canyon, you know. And we just really are grateful that that office got spared. It's, it was built in 1954. If the termites quit holding hands, I think the whole thing would probably fall down. But uh, it was the land management that actually saved that office and I think a little divine intervention mixed in. But uh, we were fortunate there. We lost, we have 33 miles of fences on the ranch. We didn't lose them all because we managed a lot of those areas. But we did have a lot of galvanization burn off the wires, which means we have to go replace all those wires. And where we had some wooden fence posts left on corner braces, some of those burned up. So we've got months and months of fence work out ahead of us to get all that fixed up. We lost a lot of pasture for the cattle. So now we're feeding the cattle every day, hoping that it does actually rain. We've had about an inch and three quarters of rain this year. So we're waiting for more rain to hopefully correct that situation in the managed pastures. But one of the main things is we lost a lot of wildlife habitat. You know, we worked really hard over these last 20 years trying to make the best wildlife habitat on that ranch we possibly can. That was the hardest part for me. Uh, Rich has seen fires come through and you know, as he presents and he always shows us before and after. So I knew that the habitat would come back to some degree but what did you tell me? It burns like 10 times hotter in a wildfire compared well, yeah. to a prescribed burn. So the land's denuded and I kept asking him, I don't see one animal around. And just even around our home, I mean, we have certain birds that are there, owls and hawks and crows and dove and quail. And it was just complete silence for a couple of days. And finally he took me out to one area that he knew that he's done some really wonderful mitigation and there were thousands and thousands of birds there. It was the most hopeful, beautiful sound I needed to hear. And he kept saying, Bonnie, the animals know what to do. But we did take some walks and those oaks that were hundreds of years old and deer that didn't make it and the wood rats and the other critters out there, that was the toughest part for me to see. 
But we had a lot of deer that did make it yeah. in those managed areas. So after things kind of crawled out, everybody hunkered down. We have, we have three cats that are like part of our family. We thought <laughs> yeah. they all burned up and four days later they appeared again because they were hiding underneath something that was left and didn't come out for four days. Oh, I was so happy to see that. And I think a lot of the wildlife did the same thing. You know, all the mitts for the wood rats burned up, and but after the third day, they realized there was some sanctuary, and I think every wood rat in the hills above Ventura moved in our house with us. They ate all our landscaping that we had just finished. <laughs> yeah, we just landscaped our whole front yard, had all these new succulent. We have a fire-safe landscape. We just have decomposed granite with succulents, you know, all throughout the landscape. They're around the house. And all the bunnies, the rabbits. But all the know. bunnies came in and ate all the succulents because there was nothing left to eat out in the hills. and. I guess they needed it more than, I, I couldn't even shoo them off because no. I knew they needed those plants more Didn't than have I the did. Heart. So we just kind of watched them do their thing and you know, sprouts came up after a few weeks and, and now the sprouts are this tall of some of the regenerating plants. So the animals have things to eat again. They're out trying to find things to make new homes. We did lose a lot of animals, but a lot were saved. And we've been monitoring those with trail cameras that we set up around the ranch where we have developed water for mm -hmm. livestock and for wildlife. And so we kept those cameras going after the fire. Some of them burned up, but we got new cameras and we've been monitoring and we see a lot of the deer coming back in. We just saw one of the mountain lions come right. back in the other day, got a really nice picture happy to of see him. Her. So we're, we're, we're really optimistic that the wildlife is gonna recover, but we have some work to do to help it recover along with the wildlife habitat.